IELTS Practice Tests 1. Published by IELTS Practice Tests. This recording is copyright. Practice Test 1. You'll hear several different recordings and you must answer questions about them. There'll be time to read the questions and you will have a chance to check what you've written. You'll only hear the recording once. The practice test is in four sections. At the end of the practice test, you can take up to 10 minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Section 1. You'll hear a phone conversation between a student and the university library. First, you'll have some time to look at the questions. Let's start. You should write your answers to the questions as you're listening, as you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer the questions. Good morning, University Library. Craig Wilson speaking. How can I help you? Oh, hi. I've just started my degree in computer science and I wonder if you could help me. Would you tell me, please, how can I join the library? Well, you need your student card, you know, your university ID card, and we also ask for two passport-sized photos. There is also a small fee. It costs £2.80. Right. And how long does it take to get my library card? I'd say it is usually ready in about two weeks. You can come to the counter and ask us for your card. I see. Can I borrow any books while my card is being processed? Yes, you can. After you complete the form, you can have a provisional card. It is valid for a month. You can use this number to collect some library books. Great! And how many books can I borrow at once? Well, you may borrow up to eight books at a time. Please note that the books should not be labelled for reference only. These include academic journals, dictionaries, encyclopedias and atlases. You are not allowed to take them out at any time. What if the book I need is not available? Well, if there is no book on the shelf, you can make a request online. There are computers on all library floors. You can use them to search our database. After you find the book in the library catalogue, you can click on the book title and enter the barcode number from your library card. As soon as the item is returned to the library, we will contact you. OK. Will you bring my mobile? Yes, if you leave your mobile number when you complete the registration form. Otherwise, we can send you an email via your university email address. I see. What times are you open? We are open from 9am to 5pm Monday to Friday, term time only. On Saturdays, we open at 9am and close at 2pm. Right, I am going there now. Thanks a lot. Cheers. Thank you. Goodbye. That's the end of section 1. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers. Now move on to section 2. Section 2. You will hear a representative of a tour group touring a popular tourist area. First, you will have some time to have a look at the questions.
Now listen and answer the questions. Welcome to the Royal Pavilion, a magnificent palace and popular tourist attraction in Brighton. We are now in the entrance hall vestibule or octagon hall, a gorgeous room in peach blossom colour. As you can see it is octagonal shaped and it was originally furnished with fret patterned chairs in Chinese style and a brass enclosed stove which provides a warm welcome to us all. Let us move on to the entrance hall. Unlike the octagon hall this room is square shaped. You can see panels of serpents and dragons on a green pale wall and these pieces of wooden furniture resembled pollarded oak. We're now going to the long gallery and this corridor is named after the 16th century house galleries where paintings were displayed. It is furnished with bamboo pattern cabinets and oriental jars. We now move on to the banqueting room. As you can see there is a long dining table and 36 satin wood chairs. It is set for the dessert course. In 1816-17 the menu was comprised of 60 dishes which had been carefully prepared by the French chef Marie Antoine Carême to the Prince Regent and his guests. We shall now see where this extraordinary menu was prepared. This is the Great Kitchen. It was also known as the King's Kitchen. If you look at the ceiling you can see four cast iron columns and copper tent like awnings as they would remove excess smells and steam from the kitchen. The kitchen fire has a smoke jack, a device for turning five spits mechanically. You are now at the splendorous music room. There are nine lotus shaped chandeliers hanging from the ceiling and they lit the room where the King's Band performed Handel or Italian Opera. Unfortunately this room was damaged by the fire of 1975 and here is a photographic display of the pavilion's restoration. On the first floor we shall see the King's and Queen's apartments. These are the yellow bow rooms. These bedrooms belong to King George IV's brothers, the Duke of York and the Duke of Clarence. It consists of a lobby, two bedrooms and servants rooms. The furniture is made out of satin wood and mahogany. Queen Victoria's bedroom was furnished with a floral patterned Brussels carpet and fine silk bed linen and window curtains. The tassels were covered in silk and wool. There is also the maid's room and you can see a woolen mattress and the closet which was used as a water closet by the Queen or William IV. That is the end of section 2. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers. Now move on to section 3. Section 3. You will hear a discussion on a radio station about education and technology. First you have time to look at the questions. Now listen carefully and answer the questions. You are listening to XSFM, the radio for inquiring minds. Remember the old times we learned history and we only had some paper and pencil and our teacher had just a tiny piece of chalk in her hand? Life has changed and technology has mediated the classroom environment. It has been a resourceful tool for teachers and learners. I'm Charles Wilson and today we are discussing the impact of technology in the classroom. With us in the studio today we have Professor Paula Jackson 
who works in the Department of Education at the University of Oxford. Good evening, Professor Jackson. Good evening. And we also welcome Professor Joseph Lewis, who teaches Computer Literacy and Educational Outcome at the University of Birmingham. Good evening, Professor Lewis. Good evening. Well, a lot has been said about the importance of revolutionary tools for education. Students can find information and are more interested in their studies. To what extent is it due to technology? Professor Jackson? Thank you. Firstly, it is important to note that education is not a result of technology. People have been interested in knowledge acquisition for centuries. The Greeks, for instance, were not provided with gadgets, and they introduced philosophy, art, and Greek mythology. In other words, people have sought information since the beginning of human existence. Professor Jackson, may I state here that education does have an intrinsic relationship with technology? Since you mentioned the Greeks, let us consider Archimedes. He was a Greek mathematician and engineer who invented the screw pump, the claw of Archimedes, and the Archimedes principle in hydrostatics. Thus, I would say that there is a connection between technology and knowledge. I see your point, Professor Lewis, but the question here is whether technology has increased students' interest in studies. I don't think technology is relevant to improve students' knowledge of subjects. You can learn a subject thoroughly, even though you are not provided with a computer. This is perfectly achievable. I don't agree with you. Technology is crucial to improve classroom learning. Crucial? Does it mean that teachers are now unable to give a single lesson without an interactive board or laptop and projector over their heads? I don't think so, Professor Lewis. No, this is not the case. I mean, I quite agree with you, Professor Jackson. A good teacher is able to give an interesting lesson with or without any technological device. But I would like to stress the importance of technology. I would say that technology is a great source of motivation and interest in studies. I mean, it has provided teachers with a useful tool for teaching school subjects. For example, students are much keener to learn about DNA and genetics when their teachers use DNA replication 3D animation. They are also eager to learn about languages when they can watch a film and read subtitles in the target language. You have got a point on that, Professor Lewis. But I wonder if teachers will ignore the richness of libraries and books and surrender themselves to technology and gadget bundles. Education must be based on traditional classroom experiences and methodologies. In fact, traditional education must be preserved. I'm not going to discuss the most adequate teaching method, Professor Jackson. However, I would like to say that there is no point undervaluing the importance of books and libraries. Actually, most libraries have had some of their content available digitally for years. There are books and journals available online, and students can access the library catalogue from their computers. In other words, technology is used to preserve traditional knowledge rather than neglect it. I don't believe that this process undermines the value of books. Well, technology is used to preserve wisdom, isn't it? Let us move on to our callers. We've got quite a few callers who are asking questions on that. Line one, we have John from Newcastle. John, are you there? That is the end of section three. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers. Now turn to section 4. Section 4. You will hear part of a lecture about post-operative pain management. First, you have some time to look at the questions.
Now listen carefully and answer the questions. In today's lecture, I'd like to look at post-operative pain and how we can manage it. Firstly, I'd like to introduce the types of pain patients experience after their surgery. The first one is cutaneous pain. Let us consider the surgical incision. Once the skin is incised, cutaneous nociceptors or free nerve endings are activated by the injury and release an acute, fast pain felt in the injury site. This is localized pain. The impulses are transmitted via afferent nerves to the central nervous system CNS, and via peripheral nerves to the spinal cord. In the spinal cord, the impulses connect with type C fibers, which, in turn, detect visceral pain. Since visceral nociceptors are in a range of organs, slow pain is felt in other parts of the body. This is why patients often complain about pain affecting different parts of their bodies. Moreover, pain synapses occur in the dorsal horn. As you can see, type A delta and type C fibers synapse with dendrites. This is due to the fact that the nerve extensions receive signals from other nerve cells. When this occurs, the pain travels up the spinal cord as neurons or nerve impulses until they reach the midbrain. The nerve impulses are then processed and transmitted to the body as a pain signal. Therefore, medication and painkillers should be administered according to the type and severity of pain. In other words, you should prescribe appropriate medication for a patient who suffers from cutaneous pain and adequate analgesia for those who suffer from visceral pain. Right, let us, let us look at the types of analgesia now. The first procedure is to determine the difference between pain threshold and pain tolerance. Pain threshold refers to the point which we all feel pain. Imagine the pain you feel when you spill boiling water on your hand. We agree that you receive a hand burn. This feeling is known as reaching the pain threshold. However, pain tolerance is described as the individual's sensitivity to pain. This is obviously very subjective as some people may be more susceptible to pain while others may have a low tolerance for pain. Nurses are instructed to hand out a questionnaire to the patients so that doctors can evaluate their pain tolerance. This questionnaire is known as the Pain Scales, Universal Pain Assessment Tool, and it will guide you on the appropriate amount of analgesics. Okay. Now let us consider the types of analgesics and their use in post-operative pain. Anti-inflammatory drugs such as non-steroidal drugs are often prescribed to patients suffering from localized pain. On the other hand, patients who feel aching pain should be treated with opiates. Opiates interrupt the transmission of nerve impulses in the dorsal horn so that they cannot cause pain any longer. Another interesting fact is that opiates have a chemical structure similar to endorphins, a natural painkiller produced by the human body. It is also important to note that pain management refers to a combination of pain relieving drugs for pain control. In fact, paracetamol and opiates can be prescribed together. Paracetamol can be administered every four hours and the amount of opiates can be reduced by 30%. It provides patients with pain relief and leads to better outcomes. That is the end of section 4. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers. That is the end of the practice listening test. In the real IELTS exam, you would now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the listening answer sheet. Thank you for listening.